You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com but now on with the show and really one of the most coveted panels of oyc the industry leaders panel always what i would call a lively panel one that never lets us down and really who better to moderate than jj kinahan in Philadelphia, we have uh, TV monitors all around every floor. And eight times a day, I always say around the group, hi, JJ, because he's on TV so many times in all the commercials. Now, everybody here knows JJ is head of market structure at TD Ameritrade. He's a CNBC regular, commentator, blah, blah, blah. But I think he's got a new uh, nickname. You've seen him in the new commercial where he has the, uh, the pool cue in his hand. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Cool Hand JJ to the stage for his panel. JJ? Thanks, Claire. Dan. Please. Thanks, Dan. You should see me eat scrambled eggs. But uh, anyway, some of the guys are still getting mic'd up. So as soon as everybody's ready, we'll get started. Uh, start with a big thank you to the NASDAQ. They've done a, they've, I'm out a nice hand for everybody here. They've done a really, okay, really sorry. tremendous job. With, with everything that's going on so far, uh, I'm going to have everybody else come on out, guys, and we'll have everybody else come out here in a second and introduce themselves, etc. Uh, look, looking forward to the panel as usual. It's always one of my favorites, and uh, I'll certainly try not to grill them too hard. Although some people have, there's been a lot of really nice suggested. I shouldn't say nice. There's been a lot of suggested questions so far uh, this week, which has been great. And we'll wait for the last two gentlemen to come on out. So, yeah, Stan's giving me the one second sign. I was looking. And we'll get them. But uh, I have a nice sock game today, by the way. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, got to show a little flair color. So. <laughs> very well done. And, well, with that, why don't we have you guys start introducing yourselves. As Dan said, I'm JJ Keenahan from TD Ameritrade. And I'll start with Ivan, and we'll just go down the row and let everybody introduce themselves. Morning, I'm Ivan Brown, head of options for NYSE. Kevin Kennedy, head of derivatives for NASDAQ. Scott Warren, chief administrative officer at OCC. Shelley Brown, head of strategic planning at MyX Options. Andy Lowenthal, co-head of markets at SIBO. And I think we still have one more, correct? And we, he's, he's, he's coming. Ed needs a, no introduction. He's special. Yeah, a man who actually needs no introduction at all. So that's what <laughs> is going to make this very, very nice when he comes out. So, all right. I'm here. Mr. Boyle. <laughs> <laughs> you could have started without me. It wouldn't have bothered me. Well, we wanted you out here because Dennis David talked about having an older brother with, I believe it was drugs and something. And I figured with all the kids in your family, you got to be able to tell us some stories there. I'm uh, taking the fifth. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely take it, it would take the rest of the panel time? Yes. Uh, uh, so, well, welcome everyone. And, uh, you know, one of the things when I was thinking about the questions to ask for this panel, when I go to these conferences, often I leave feeling like, oh my God, I want to kill myself. <laughs> this is the worst industry of all time with nothing but problems. And I really don't feel that way. I think, I think in general tend to be kind of positive, positive about our industry. I, I get the pleasure of talking to retail clients on a re very regular basis. People actually, I know it's maybe a surprise to many, people love our industry. And it's exciting to see retail clients coming into it and being excited about it. So where I actually wanted to start today with you know, we just came off the quarter where we've done more options contracts, as we all learned yesterday from Henry in a great presentation, than we've ever done before. So we should be proud of a lot of the things going on. So where I want to start is what we're doing well and should be doing a heck of a lot more of. And I'll just start with Ivan to my right here. Yeah, I mean, something that I think um, often goes underappreciated or undernoticed because when it functions well, things are smooth is the fact that our capital markets are the envy of the world, right? And that's a function of the deep pools of liquidity. It's a function of their transparency. 
but it's you know also a function of their resiliency. And so when we look at you know this last quarter, for example, and volatility is up north of 40 percent, and volumes are up north of 30 percent, the options markets performed very well, very smoothly, right? And from you know from our perspective, uh, we look at it sort of year over year, we processed double the amount of messages on average in Q1 of this year than we did over the same period of last year. And we did it with lower latency and higher determinism than any period prior to that. And that's not just a positive reflection on, on NYC, it's a testament to, to all these gentlemen and their teams as well, because we've invested tremendously in technology and risk controls to ensure that the markets operate smoothly. And ultimately, that helps to inspire investor confidence, which results in good engagement from folks in your clients. That's very true. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask the same question all the way down. Kevin? Sure. Thanks, JJ, and thanks for hosting um, the panel. So you and I share the same optimism. You know, we've chatted off and on over the years about this. It is a great industry, and I think we do a lot well. I mentioned this a little bit in my opening remarks, but they're worth repeating. I think that you know, we're, we're built, a lot of us in this industry are former traders and have that trader mentality, so a lot of us wants to want to fix things right away, overnight. And I think to start, one of the things we do well is we actually are a little more thoughtful than, than our trading instincts would, would might hint toward being. So I think it's good, again, the conference, and this is where we, we air these things out, but I think we've moved very methodically and thoughtfully because when you compare us to equities, there's no doubt in my mind we have a much better market structure and they have many more challenges. I think we address our challenges as well, but I think it goes back to three basic tenets that we have in, in, our, in, in our ecosystem, which is, and, and it's really a testament to our Sullivan Award winner this year, Gary Katz, and that they brought what you see is what you get to the options mm -hmm. industry. So we have firm quote, and, and you know when your retail customer of his 18 lot, he's getting his 18 lot, and we don't have an issue with that. So I think our firm quote, our quoting obligations, which continuously evolve, and there's always room for improvement there, but we have a quoting obligation, and it's good. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, I think the key to what we do well is that our market structure has exposure. And I think the fact that orders are exposed and competed for is what drives a lot of our complaining, is that I'm not touching enough. I see it, and I didn't get it. I wasn't fast enough. The, the, the nuclear race is just too fast. But there was exposure. There's something we're all reaching for. So I think those three tenants, exposure, firm quotes, and quoting obligations are, are key to some of the things that we do well. Well, Scott, with maybe a little different perspective coming from the <clears throat> OCC and not you know, necessarily from the exchange point of view, what would you say on this? I think part of it is sort of the health of the ecosystem, right, and the diversity of market participants. In particular, the demand for education on options. And the team at OIC with Mary Savoy and Frank Tirado, Eric Cott, Joe Burgoyne, and Gary Delaney, in the demand for educational services, we're bringing new participants into the options industry and the option market. And I think that's really encouraging because you need customer participation. And the demand and interest in using listed options and the outreach to registered investment advisors, I think is a really encouraging sign that the, the growth can continue because you're bringing in new participants. And then to amplify what Ivan said, is the resiliency of the industry, right? Um, February 5th extraordinary day, 17 standard deviation move in the volatility of volatility, markets perform, processing worked, it's a resilient industry. We can absorb new information, respond, and get people prices and fills and the products work. Well, and, and I think the education element, you know, we spend a lot of time on it, as do, uh, you know, our competitors. You know, one of our primary goals is we refer to it as nuns to ones get somebody to make their very first options trade, be it a covered call, whatever, because that really, that's the key to the business going forward, is just get people comfortable with one possible contract. Shelly? JJ, thank you, and thank you for OCC for all you do for the industry. Um, we love the fact that it's a competitive marketplace, that new entrants can come into the marketplace and compete with the old guard. Uh, there's been consolidation, unprecedented, unprecedented consolidation over the last two years. Uh, with nine exchanges either already changing hands or about to change hands. Uh, but new exchanges and, and the current exchanges still have the ability to compete on innovation, whether it be technology, market, make, market model, or new products. Um, we've helped raise the bar, and we work together and compete against each other, raising the bar with more robust technology, transparency, and trying to make the experience cheaper for all of the members and users. 
we think the competition is great. It's, it's competition up on the stage, or <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you'd like to, with a lot of people up here. Right? Yeah. I, I, I was joking with Ivan, saw him earlier today, and said, between everybody up here, you only get to talk twice, so make the most of it, man. There you go. <laughs> we'll do our best. A Andy? So we just celebrated this week our 45th anniversary, the industry's 45th anniversary. And I was looking at, the, we put out a blog this week, and I looked at the list of things that have been innovated out of this business. And it's been consistent, and it's been, it's actually, it was, was eye-opening. I mean, if you look at what we've done with this industry in a relatively short amount of time, and the amount of things that we will continue to do, you know, and you, you can go back to things like the introduction of, well, the introduction of, of, listed, of listed markets, then, and puts, and then, you know, turn, the, the early 90s, the introduction of flex options, the introduction of, introduction of VIX, SPX, weeklies, I mean, the list goes on and on. And I think we should be very proud of ourselves that what we've been able to do in a relatively short amount of time compared to many other industries, and I'm fully confident that the innovation will continue as we, as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Mr. Boyle, I'll, I'll try to You're not telling us family stories about Jimmy or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're running out of, <clears throat> I'm running out of uh, responses here because my peers have done a good job of covering really a lot of what, uh, what, what options is about and why it's been such a great product. I think resiliency, Ivan, was one of the, that, that's a key to it. We, exchanges don't go down anymore. Ever since we digitized the marketplace, it used to be common where the markets would, would go down a lot, and they don't anymore. Our option markets are continuously lit. They're always there. Even if an exchange does have a hiccup, the other ones are there to cover for them. <clears throat> so I think that's a very important part. Um, the other area is education and how well we've gotten the engine. We, we've talked about this for years. Ever since I started this business, I remember talking about education and OIC did a great job with it and everything that we do. And that education has finally trickled down. We're actually seeing the results and I, I think everyone deserves a, a big pat on the back for this, particularly the retail firms who've built a lot of tools. They've integrated the, plat the product into their platforms and so have the institutions. The institutions now, institutional platforms and access to the market are something that was never there before. Everyone can access our markets quickly, freely, and at, at extremely low, uh, low cost structures. So that's a, a highly important part. And then Andy had touched on products. Products and innovation have taken a, a, a lead role in what we've done and changed. You look at what trades today versus where the trades were you know, 20 years ago, it's very different, complex orders, weekly options, things like that. So if we keep innovating and keep doing this, we will be able to solve, or we've solved a lot of these problems. So now. The next question is, what are we going to, you know, what, what's out there to solve going forward? And we know there's always things out there. Well, I'm glad you said that because you get to go first on that one. Exactly. <laughs> and all the other you know, Over the last few days, we've heard a lot of the problems that do face our industry. I thought the last panel, they brought up some things that, you know, are, are an issue, be it market maker funding. You know, we've heard about exchanges, fees. You get to pick which of these topics you'd like to talk about you see as the biggest problem or a couple of problems facing our industry and you know, what can we do to at least begin to solve them? Because as Kevin said, and I think it's important, it's great that we all come together, but I feel like sometimes we leave and we come back the next year and talk about exactly the same things. So do you have any, even if it's a partial solution, I think that gets us started in the right direction. Yeah, I, I don't know that I would say I've got the solution for any of the problems, but I think the key part is, <clears throat> is that we recognize the problem. And in recognizing a problem, a big part of that is to make sure we're asking the right questions first. Let's not try to fix something that maybe isn't broken. And we see that often in, in not only our business but others where people try to fix something because they have a perception that it's not working well. I mean, the, the one thing that I think needs attention is auctions in the market today. Box was the innovator of auctions. We started them years ago, it was before my, before my time there, but it was to solve a very a problem in the market and it did solve that problem in the market. The problem is the markets have evolved now and we, pennies are now in the market, they weren't then, and our, our regulators as well as us as participants aren't always good at saying, okay, what do we need to, to take out of the markets rather than how do we fix a problem that's in it or how do we adjust how we do things? And I think auctions is one of those. Uh, I'm not saying that's a problem in the market, I think it's part of a bigger picture. Um, and, and while we all have talked about that for quite a while, uh, I think we could continue to, uh, to address it as well as a lot of the, really what it comes down to is a two-tiered structure. We don't currently have a two-tiered structure. The regulators are very against that, but, but auctions create it. So it's, it's solving a problem, it's still solving one. 
how can we adjust it so it solves that problem but acts differently? So you're saying a two-tiered structure in terms of retail and then other market maker <coughs> to market maker type trading? Or? Yeah, and I guess when I say two-tier, I shouldn't say two, I should say multi. So it, it's really got to do with the type of participant is accessing the market and how, the, uh, how they, they respond inside of that market. Okay. Andy? Um, we have to address the market maker health issue. It's, it's what this industry most needs to be focused on. Um, you know, I don't know if it's too many exchanges, too many series, and we can go on and on what, what, where the problems lie. Um, but it's time for us to come together as an industry. Uh, yesterday, in, in Eric's exchange remarks, he referenced the, uh, the formation of an options market structure committee where all of us can get together in, in a room with, under, under the auspices uh, of the SEC, not just the exchanges, but the uh, market participants, and start talking about these issues. But I think the, the driver for change is to, at the top of the list, market maker health. And we fix that and start making changes in some of the things that have impacted that We'll be in, this industry will grow and we'll be in a great place. Yeah, I, I, th I think that's really important and sometimes, you know, the market maker function I think is underrated in our business and how much we need that, as much as you guys are all competing on many levels, the continued competition between market makers is really, really important for the health of this industry and I don't know that that's always seen by everyone uh, from regulators to daily participants in the market of how much we need them. Shelley? Yeah, I, I agree with what both these gentlemen have said about the health of the market and the need for the market makers. Uh, we're driven by liquidity and that liquidity is on the screen and we hear constantly from some sectors in the industry that there's not enough liquidity in the screen or the markets are too wide. Uh, we hear from other constituencies that they want to be able to internalize and really don't want the market makers in the way and it's, it's an interesting conflict between those two. But if we want to continue to have a thriving market, we have to have liquidity in the marketplace. The market makers, there's, there's so few left relative to when most of us were on the trading floors. Um, the, the capital rules need to be addressed. Um, we believe there's a concentration of clearing amongst the market makers, which poses a risk to the industry. Um, certainly we're all, well not we are all competing with the market makers, but all of you are competing with the market makers. Um, they, they provide a vital function in our lit markets. And whether it be working on reducing the auctions, uh, giving them better incentives to trade, cutting their capital costs, um, helping reduce their, their fixed costs at the exchanges, these are all things we need to look at as an industry and determine how do we want to promote that liquidity on the screen. Scott? So I think I support the, the view of the health of the ecosystem in the first order derivative of the market maker health is the clearing firm health, right? And not to retread the ground that we've heard a lot this morning is the capital requirements uh, driving our industry. And it starts with supplemental leverage ratio and making sure initial customer margin is appropriately deducted from clearing firm exposure as it should be. And then you move into the risk rated or risk weighted assets environment where the idea of gross notional uh, doesn't really reflect the risk uh, that market makers present um, in whether or not we can get to SACR uh, more quickly, uh, pursuing, you know, relatively narrow interpretive relief from the banking regulators uh, or legislative action to help address that more quickly, I think is critically important. And then closer to home, OCC is doing a comprehensive review of our own clearing fund methodology as well as our margin methodologies to make sure they're efficient and effective and prudentially oriented because it's obviously very important that OCC have the right level of pre-funded financial resources, but we have to be effective and efficient. And the capital requirements, if we have too much, are very significant for the market participants. And so making sure that we've appropriately sized those resources in a transparent way um, is critically important to ensuring confidence in the industry. Kevin, if you don't. So I think it's been 21 minutes, <laughs> and no one's listed, no one's mentioned strike prices yet, and how many? Yeah, huh? <laughs> I, I was so, going to follow up if no one had mentioned I, I had the under. Um, so one of the things I'm thinking is, building off Andy's remarks yesterday and, and Eric's remarks yesterday about um, an options MSEC, we've been, we've been touting the same thing for quite a while, and I think we have to work with the regulator and get them comfortable with the idea of more bureaucracy. So we're open to that, and I think it helps us talk about the two suggestions I'm about to make, one or two I've mentioned in the past, but maybe not in this forum. We had a problem at Amazon a few weeks ago 
where it was late in the day, and there was an obvious error, and it, it took all of the exchanges way too long to resolve it, way too long, like through, through early morning the next morning. So we, we do that really poorly. So there's optimist, there's Kevin the optimist, and then there's Kevin the realist. This, we're in the, the realism mode. We have to fix that. that that's, that's staring us right down the bowling alley, straight down. We have to fix that. The best way to fix that, I think, is to at least entertain the idea of a central clearing corporation that does exceptional in certain areas of operations that we take for granted. Perhaps in, in events like that, maybe being a central part that we all fund and, it's, and it's, they make the call. And maybe it's one call being done and maybe instead of taking 13 hours, it takes an hour and a half or seven minutes and maybe that way we can get some of it automated through one central part of technology. So I think if we can build something, if we can get together, first of all, and then talk about maybe something where there's a central, something we all invest in, and it's at OCC, maybe they can handle some of the obvious error logistics. When it's, maybe, when it, maybe we still do the one-offs ourselves, and also we can handle the strike prices that way too. So you could have maybe, and I know it's a competitive issue with strikes to some degree because of our history, but if they're the right, rules set up and you have to you know, have one or two with veto power or whatever, I think you can handle the strike problem a little bit too. So I'd like to see OCC take a more significant role in some of the operations of the exchanges, which I think then to come full circle would solve some of the fragmentation issues that we have. Well, and, and, and to your point, I guess the question I would have, and, and I'll let you talk in a second, obviously I have an answer. Uh, you know, Paul Gigani through SIFMA options and Ellen have really led an effort to reduce the number of strikes. And I think having the OC, I, I, I don't know that we believe that these strikes should be a competitive issue. Because let's face it, if one exchange is listing them, they're all going to list them. Mm -hmm. So what happens is now every market maker has to respond to all these strikes across all these exchanges. And they're pro you know, reducing the number lets them focus in on doing a better job with the strikes that actually trade. To add strikes that don't trade. And, and, and again, one of the things I always wonder is, I believe when I was on the floor 10, 15 years ago, there were rules about when a strike went up, you had to trade it within a certain amount of time. And I don't believe that rule exists anymore. And I think we need to get back to some of that because strikes are something that I find it hard to believe anybody can believes is a competitive issue anymore because everyone's going to have them the next day. Well, the counter side to that is though, once you've listed a strike and once open interest exists, you don't get to delist it. Right, because we've had the converse effect, and what we don't want to do is have customers stranded with right. open interest in no vehicle. And I, so it, we, it's it's both listing and delisting in a much more. Well, I wouldn't fashion. disagree with that, but I, I would I would say our first step should be let's delist all those that are under a nickel yep. that the strike above it is under a nickel, and neither one has open interest. But, but JJ, doesn't this go back to what I was saying earlier about we have to make sure we're asking the right questions? Are we trying to solve something that's it's a problem? But why is it a problem? It's a problem because the quotes are wide. Well, why are the quotes wide? It's well, it, I'm not even talking about the wide quotes. I'm talking about the ones under a nickel. I, I mean, you know, I, I agree. Zero, but zero what I'm nickel, is we, we, we've got to be putting strikes on the screen these days really isn't that expensive, except from well, the market maker on screen risk standpoint. Well, isn't well, but we can't say we're helping. <laughs> it's hard no. to say we really want the market makers to be strong and then say, well, no, but you can them. solve it differently than just saying delist them, get rid of them. We shouldn't even have it out there. This is this is akin to the, the retail store saying, oh, just take it off your shelves if it's not selling. But isn't well, there... maybe you find a different way, like you create an online store where people can buy it. So maybe we need to be thinking about it differently. That's all I'm getting at is that I, I see too much knee jerk reaction to fix things quite often that maybe should be thought about differently. And that's, uh, it worries me with the strike piece too, that you know, maybe they should all go RFQ. There. That's a much smarter idea in my opinion. Well, I don't know if we want to go to all of them as RFQ. No, no, I mean just that. that I'm yeah. saying instead of delist them, turn them RFQ. Yeah. Okay. And so that, that solves the problem that we're trying to address. And that's, but, that's I know I mean, there's no, we're making sure, yeah, sorry Ivan, I didn't no, no, make your time. No, it's all good. I mean, there, there, I think there's an implicit cost in the strike question too, right, in the form of investor confusion, right, where you have, a, a litany of strikes in it, in, and because there's, it's an embarrassment of riches. There's too many choices, ergo I won't make a choice. Mm -hmm. And I think, I agree with you, Ed, that we want to make sure that our policy is informed and not done in a rash way. I think if you look, and I am not professing to be the strike expert, uh, you know, certainly uh, on, on the stage. However, if you look at it, I mean, the strike program is, is an amalgamation of a lot of different programs that have occurred over time, right? Dollar strikes and 50 cent strikes and $2 and 50 cent strikes, et cetera all of which you know, an exchange is entitled to submit a certain number of symbols into that program. And um, once you know, 
uh, I submit symbol A, everyone you know, can copy symbol A, and Kevin submits symbol B, and everyone can copy symbol B. And the thing is that someone gets exacerbated by the number of venues we have now, and so when you look at it when this has sort of been assembled in a piecemeal, piecemeal fashion, should we take a step back and say, well, actually, what do we think is good for the industry in terms of the, the types of products that deserve dollar strikes, holistically, mm -hmm. not just on a venue by venue by venue basis? Um, I think that, that can start to help condense and coalesce things around. I mean, the other side of it, too, is like strike granularity. Do we need extremely fine granularity six to nine months out, or does it make sense to, to have less granularity there, but as you get closer and closer in time, the strategies become more specific, uh, the exposure requirements are more specific, ergo tighter granularity as we get to six months or three months, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I, I I'd like to pick up on Eddie's RFQ idea. I mean, I really think this industry has to give serious thought to that. Um, we have it in Flex. It's not something, that, and it's probably the reason Flex hasn't adapted to where, where we all think it could have gone. Um, but um, centralizing liquidity, posted liquidity, to the strikes that people want to trade, the near term, you know, uh, and, and and maybe less granular in the further term, but making the other product available, but teaching our customers that there is liquidity, just not posted, but there are other market makers that are willing and able to make good markets without necessarily having to put it on the screen, really could help this industry. I really do think that, and I think that's something that we could take to the to the adoption market structure committee and have that discussion. And maybe we come out a different way, but I think that's where I'd like to start it. It's an interesting thought. However. Doesn't that fly in the face of the problem of wider quotes and everything going into auctions? Effectively, you're saying everything in those options goes into auctions. Oh. There's not wide quotes. There's no quotes. No, I'm saying so. let's let's get better, tighter quotes in the series that are more the most active ones, and then the wings that, that are less active, which spreads out the market makers' inability to make mar markets where they most want to make liquidity. Um, give them give them the opportunity to focus their their posted liquidity just in those series. So now everybody can see why it's hard for us to solve yes. these issues. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I think addressing the strikes, the listing of the strikes rather than delisting, we list way too many weeklies. Not that there's too many weekly expirations. We go way too far on both sides with strikes because we have the ability to within the rule and there's, there seems to be a tendency to look at those options, that the monthlies have been out there for nine months and have experienced nine months of movement in the market and then we just take that same list of strikes and dump it on the weeklies. Now that we have some classes that have three expirations each week, it's a crazy number of weekly expirations. It's great for the industry if people are trading the weeklies, it brings in a lot of interest, but we just have too many strikes and an option that's gonna expire in five weeks. Why do we need strikes 30, 40, 50% away from the money? Well, you are the guys to control it. I love that. So, I, well, so we're a copycat exchange in that aspect. We don't ever list any new strikes, but for competitive reasons, we list what the other exchanges mm -hmm. list. So this goes back to Kevin's idea that we should get together with OCC or a single administrator and make logical decisions based on what we list. If you have a, a stock that's trading at a 30 or 40 vol, we should go deeper on a percentage basis than you need to on a stock that's at a 15 and, and vol. And we do that today oh. for OCC for just listing a security, right? Yes. We have to certify with, so why not have sort of a similar process? Absolutely. With listing. So, well, all right, good. It Problem would be solved. great uh, if you guys could. Problem solved. <laughs> one of the things that hopefully could comfort us meetings, you could agree to some sort of governance committee around how strikes are listed. I, th I think, I find it hard to believe there's anybody here who wouldn't be in support of some sort of governance of how and why strikes are listed. It's great, we list strikes that people have interest, but to your point, Shelley, there are so many strikes that are, I hate to say worthless, as a pun on words, but they really are. Nobody's ever trading them. Right. Just to order a magnitude, I think we have 950,000 different strikes and hold open interest in probably 50 to 60,000. Mm -hmm. So, you know, less than 10% of what we list is used. Mm -hmm. and, and That's I mean, a lot of excess. We have a question actually coming in. It's exactly exactly this. It talks about with 900,000 strikes listed, how can we list $1 strikes on deep in the money options, and, and, and especially if there's no open interest there. I, and I think that we're all kind of going about addressing this in a different way, but that is exactly one of the issues we see. And, and I think one of the things we also have to be careful of as we head into this committee or anything else is we as an industry, I think, have a little bit of a tendency to, as they say, boil the ocean rather than just trying to solve one or two things, simply trying to solve everything at once. So I, I, I would kind of challenge everybody, and as I said, if you guys could agree to have a governance committee on that, 
I think it will be a wonderful, wonderful first step coming out of, coming out of today. You can, you can uh, be the chairman. I'm happy to. <laughs> <laughs> if you'll ag agree to agree, that'll be easy. All right. um, and so one of the other things I think I'd be remiss if I didn't address a little bit is where do you see the amount of exchanges? We're up here, we'll say, same committee, five years. Wh how many exchanges will we have? What will costs look like, et cetera? I know that I'm asking you to talk about a crystal ball a little bit, but I think that that's something that a lot of people are like, do we think this is going to 25, or do we think that we're at the perfect number right now? You know, what does everybody sort of see in that? Now let's, one go ahead, Shelly. One away from the perfect number. <laughs> I, was including, I was including your new number as I was about to speak about it, but Ivan, go ahead. No, I mean, I, I think Shelley raised a good point before, which is the fact that this industry is able to be open to free entry of, of, of new entrants and that that drives competition and that's healthy for the marketplace, which, you know, I, I entirely agree because healthy competition encourages innovation and hopefully that is to the benefit of, of you know, all stakeholders. Um, and, it's, and competition is healthy to the extent that it offers greater utility to the industry or solves an unmet need or something that hasn't been fulfilled yet. Um, but the interesting parallel is that in a lot of, under, a lot of other industries, um, goods and services compete on merit only, right? So the value of the good or service you provide is indicative of you know, someone coming to support you. And, based upon the way our market structure exists today, that paradigm is distorted, right? Um, you're obliged to connect irrespective of whether you think that market provides incremental utility to you or not. And I think we're kind of an inflection point as we talked about strikes and what that means in terms of like the number of weekly symbols each exchange gets, et cetera, to reevaluate perhaps what does it mean to have a protected quote? Um, it's something that we think about in other asset classes as well. The important part of it is, is wanting to make sure that you have good objective criteria to evaluate it and make sure that you have a good understanding of best X and what it would mean in that kind of environment, but it allows you to compete on, on merit, right, ultimately. And if you're providing a good or service that, that the industry recognizes and rewards and finds valuable, then you'll get increased business and you'll earn that protected quote or vice versa. So can I ask a question on that? Are you saying that uh, you know you should be able to come into the industry with a protected quote and then earn the right to keep it, or are you saying you have to earn it from the very beginning? I, mean, I think I'm, I think we're open to all types of conversation. I mean, I think it would be for existing markets as you know as, as well. I mean, you need to remain relevant and compelling. Um, so I think there has to be some notion of of giving someone a chance and 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 proving themselves. Um, but then at some point that needs to be reevaluated. But obviously we're open to, to hearing more about that. There, so. There's a fine balance there, though, right? Because you're creating a barrier now, and that's, a, um, that, that's, that's artificial, that's, that's creating a duopoly is what you're doing at the end of the day. Because as you do that, you can kind of start to lock out new entrants coming into the marketplace. I, I think it's really focusing more on the current rules and the structure that we live in under NMS. I mean, if someone is providing the best quote, and it's a protected quote, you should be, you, you, obviously people need to come <coughs> to that market. Your point of merit, if a retailer opens up and just has much higher prices, people may not go there and they will slowly go out of business. As an exchange has no quotes on the screen, there no one's going to go there. But at the same time, there's other pieces under NMS where they can, whether it's um, you know, printing. We don't, have, we don't have TRFs in the options market. The equities does. Equities has been addressing this exact problem for years, even though they've got the TRF piece, so they've got 40-plus markets. Uh, JJ, to answer your question, well, in the current market environment we're in, it's going to be much higher than it is now, the total number. Um, exchanges have no reason not to continue to light them up, and new entrants have no reason not to come into the marketplace. Well, I think the free entry thing, which is what I started with, is very important, and that has to be preserved. At the same time, though, there has to be a balance between there's an implicit cost of writing to each of these exchanges, even if there wasn't a lit, a lit quote. And so someone should have the opportunity to prove themselves, but then there has to be some level of sustained value add to justify the cost, right? There's a, there's a balance there. Free competition is absolutely important, it's just you need to compete on merit. And anyone else? I think competing on merit, what it's all about. You know, we brought an exchange to market a year ago and went to 5% market share in 13 months. We brought a new value proposition to the industry, whether it be the speed, the risk protections, 
and it's, it's raised the bar for everyone, and everyone's gotten better. We've all benefited from the competition in the exchange space. And that, it does add cost, but at the same time, it's given a better experience to everybody that uses the product. Um, one, one of the questions that just came in is uh, around the pilot programs, and we know we have a lot of them. I believe that when Chairman Clayton was just in Chicago and Brett, they said that there were 78 pilots going on right now, if I'm not mistaken. Hmm. But um, how often are you supplying data to the SEC, or how public is the data coming from the exchanges? To I mean, I think the Penny Pilot should probably not be a pilot anymore. I, I think we can all <laughs> go out on that limb. But uh, you know, how, how often are you guys trying to push to end these pilots and to get rid of pilots that have outlived their usefulness or should be full-time roles? Well, that, that, that's not a, that's really not a question we can answer because at that symposium, I asked, actually asked Chairman Clayton yeah. that question. I said, okay, you, he, he stated that we have too many pilots, we need to get rid of them, there's need to be metrics around them. To answer your question directly, we all supply data to the SEC continuously in the penny pilot. Um, how much of it they make publicly available, quite honestly, I'm not sure, but they, um, they are the ones who have the power to continue to go on with that. When I asked that question in the symposium, uh, it was dismissed as, uh, don't worry, we'll make the decision when we make it. So I, I think that uh, it's a very valid question. I think all of us would like to see it solved. We'd probably like to see it solved with some some metrics around it that would limit the amount of strikes that can go into it, mm -hmm. but uh, it's a, it's a, I think it's a pain to all of us. The discussion in the penny pilot became, at some level, a competitive issue, and some exchanges thrived in the non-penny names, some in the penny names, but it all interacts with that whole function of the market maker. It's a different environment for the market maker in a penny stock than in a non-penny stock. It's a different environment for the quote throughputs and the bandwidth requirements when you're a penny stock versus non-penny stock. Why do we have stocks in the penny pilot that they trade in pennies, but the market's still 18, 20, 30 cents wide? Why do we need a quote that's 21.41 versus 20.40? Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's probably too many stocks in the penny pilot right now, and by reducing the number of stocks in the pilot, reduces the number of quotes, reduces the burden on the whole industry. Let's pick the stocks where it really makes sense to trade in pennies, keep them in the pilot, then we can make it a permanent. So uh, one question that that kind of brings up for me, and, and we, we don't have a lot of time, so just a quick sort of answer from you. What right now, be it Orphe, be it the penny pilot, you know, things like this that are being used as competitive issues, shouldn't be? Should we kind of number of strikes? I don't know what it is. Do you have any feeling on what should we agree? This is silly to have as, as a competitive issue. Regulatory costs should not be a competitive issue. Either we should have a single entity doing that regulation for all of us or find a better way, but we have to fund that regulation. The SEC requires the exchanges to perform a certain level of market reg, whether you're a brand new exchange or an existing exchange. It doesn't cost, the, your cost of regulation isn't necessarily correlated directly to your market share, so to try to break it up that way doesn't make sense, but we can make things more efficient. Any of us that have multiple exchanges, we have economy of scale internally for the ORF. So the, the second exchange doesn't cost near as much as the first exchange. The third exchange doesn't cost as much as the second exchange. And, and certainly the investors and users of the product have to understand that the ORF is not a profit center for any of us up here. It covers a portion of our regulatory costs, and those regulatory costs are going nowhere but up. But we can be. Our clients know that. But all of us can be more <laughs> transparent in what we define as regulatory costs. And I Agreed. Think, so I think, I think to have an unlevel playing field of definition of what falls under that category is something that we can address. And, I, and there's no reason to have one exchange define it differently than another exchange. And, and kudos Agreed. to the CBO. I think you guys took the first step last quarter on publishing a little bit more transparency. And I know the rest of you have said that you will do some more around that. And I, I think it's great. I, you know, at the end of the day, I think people don't really mind fees as much if they sort of understand where the fees are going to, rather than just a, it's going to re regulatory. Well, we get that, but again, any transparency helps on things like that. But uh, anybody else wanted to add? Yeah, to I that? would just, add, I, I mean, hands down to me would be getting OCC involved in the strike process. They do it, they do it for new listings. Let's do it for strikes. That doesn't solve the RWA issue, but it solves one of the symptoms or one of the ramifications of the RWA issue that we've been talking about all week. It, it solves a lot of problems. I mean, Scott's, Scott's data point about the open interest being in Amazing. less than 10%, you know, another thing that's staring us in the face, that that's solvable. It's something that, you know, if, if 
if approved and the regulator approves it and we could have this conversation, I think we could solve it in three meetings and we'd be, we'd be so much better off. I think we'd get a lot of leverage out of that. Well, and I thank you for bringing it in because it does tie in directly to the regulatory cost when we're calculating a capital requirement mm -hmm. on gross notional value without netting. As long as somebody holds open interest in that, it drives up the capital cost and, and we've got way too many strikes with people just holding the position. I'm curious, your, your measurement of percentage of options or strikes that have open interest, is it options or strikes? The reason I ask the question is because we see the open interest yeah. in the out of the money options, we have to have the corresponding in the money as well. Yeah. So there was a question earlier about right. why do we have so many deep in the money options? That's why. Well, you have to have a deep in the money if you have an out of the money because that's the way the systems work. Yeah. Do the systems necessarily need to work that way? Do we have to have calls and puts? Or can we have Maybe not. Yeah, you know, some band of at the monies where you have both and then further out of the money lower strikes, you have just puts and just calls of the further out of the money. It's just another way it, of well, looking it's an at interesting it. way to think another about way of solving it. the problem. On, on our platform, and I know some of our competitors, you can actually do that if you want to now because nobody's doing a fifty dollar deep in the money conversion reversal as a retail well, client. All, all it yeah. is is stock and it's huge delta risk for those market makers that are required to make two sided markets and every option. So and, and then the last, we only got less than a minute. So if somebody wants to jump on this, our last question is, do you think RFQ will make the screens go even darker and actually the intended uh, have the exact opposite intent of everything we're trying to do in terms of tra more you? transparency? It, yeah, and Shelly, <laughs> Shelly kind of asked it. I think I brought up RFQ, so I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this question because I, I think it's, it's a valid question, but at the end of the day, RFQ, we're not talking about RFQ for the markets and all the markets. We're talking about the RFQ for just those strikes that don't make sense to to have on the screen, and the reason they don't make sense, it goes back to what I said earlier, there's not a cost to putting strikes on the screen. We're, we're good at technology now, scale's there, storage isn't a big deal anymore. All those costs have come way down. The cost is to the market participants, and really the liquidity providers, the registered market makers. These guys are required to quote these, and when they quote them, they have a, a risk that's on the screen that very few people pay attention to. It's called open order risk, and that means that if they were to be swept on X percent of their quotes and the market was to move adversely against some X percent, how much money would they have to have to make certain they could clear those trades that night? And that number swells to ridiculous amounts when you're required to have a quote on the screen that can be, that can be accessed with a firm quote at any time. And um, th these numbers get into the hundreds of millions of dollars for good market makers. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a big problem. So would the screens go darker? No, those strikes would go away from a, a, a displayed standpoint. Yeah, they'd go dark. But the at the money strikes, the stuff that trades, the 60,000 with open interest, would get brighter if that's the right word. We'd actually have size on the screens, tighter markets. And then we also need the market makers. Uh, you know, Andy brought it up. It's, it probably is the most important part. Market makers, we need to pull that pendulum back. Market makers need a fair environment. Liquidity provision is a service. They deserve to be paid for it. You can't say, oh, provide liquidity only when we want it, but when we don't, we're not refused to gonna, you know, pay you and charge you a lot of fees. We need to improve that. We need to improve it dramatically. So Kevin, last word I for 30 I'll seconds. I promise I'll say 15 seconds. I think if we think about RFQ just maybe a little differently and not for this, maybe, maybe there's just sort of an opening rotation quote in it that's, and I, and I love firm quote, as I said earlier, it's one of our basic tenets, but maybe just for symmetry and just for some indication that your customers, JJ, can see what they would be worth, or roughly you have sort of an opaque firm opening rotation an, an quote indicative by the quote specialist or something. An indicative quote. Yeah, an indicative. An indicative. Quote. Yes. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, how about a hand for these gentlemen? They did a great job. Thank you. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.